have been covering the war in Ukraine since its start, and consistently calling it unprovoked in our videos. Russia has been all over the place in trying to justify its aggression against Ukraine by mentioning Casas Belli, ranging from the expansion of NATO, the build-up of anti-Russia attitudes in Ukraine, the security threat coming from Ukraine, the protection of the Russian-speaking population in Donbass, bringing peace to Ukraine, elimination of biolabs in Ukraine, to a gathering of so-called historic Russian lands a la Peter the Great. We will discuss some of these claims in this video, which have become narratives of Russian war propaganda. The human cost isn't just limited to literal casualties. Last winter, the invasion triggered supply restrictions and massive sanctions which sent energy bills all over Europe through the roof. Millions faced extreme poverty, and experts now think people as far as North America will endure price fluctuation for several years. It's weird to see on the news that inflation is finally cooling off, but also read forecasts of energy bills tripling or even quadrupling this summer. Who wants problems like this weighing on their minds while planning a family trip to the beach? We just want to survive this chaos and to do so we must try and make our money work for us. And this means investing with stability and growth potential in mind. Collecting uncorrelated assets. Investments less likely to be impacted by global events like wars and energy crises. Today's sponsor Masterworks is giving investors access to a historically exclusive investment on the market, fine art. 2022 was the best auction year ever for the art market. And while retail investors lost an estimated $350 billion on the stock market, Masterworks paid out over $25 million in net returns to their investors. Every Masterworks exit to date has delivered positive returns to their investors, which is why it's easy to see why over 700,000 people have signed up. Offerings have sold out in minutes, and as economic conditions stagnate, they have experienced increased demand for offerings. But our subscribers can skip the waitlist and get priority access by clicking the link in the description. Number 1. Why are we calling the war unprovoked? Because even though Ukraine is successfully resisting Russia in this war, its military was just not strong enough to realistically threaten Russia at all before the war. Defensive and offensive wars are different things and require different levels of military capacity. At no point was Ukraine capable of attacking Russia, or indeed had any intentions to do so. That is just untrue. Russia started its war of aggression against Ukraine in 2014 when it blatantly ignored the 1994 Budapest Memorandum and illegally annexed Crimea, along with taking parts of Donetsk and Luhansk blasts under control through its proxies. Ukraine would have been well within its rights to seek to restore its territorial integrity through military means, but there are no indications that the Ukrainian government was gearing up to do that. They simply lacked offensive weapons to attempt such a major operation. You can always manufacture a myth to justify your wars of aggression, but that does not make them just or legal. Russia started this war of aggression in 2014 before starting a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. There are no indications whatsoever that Russia's national security was under any more threat in February 2022 than it was, let's say, in 2015 or 2017. Ever since Putin's speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, Russia has made its position clear. It wants to challenge the US-led global order. They want to return to the state of affairs where several global powers divided the world into spheres of influence. Russia sees the independent republics of the former Soviet Union as its sphere of influence, as its backyard, or as they call it, the near abroad. They don't tolerate the intentions of its former subjects to integrate with the West, and have punished Georgia in 2008 for this, and are trying to do the same to Ukraine now. Moreover, Putin's essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, published in 2021, clearly shows his disrespect for Ukraine's sovereignty. He sees Ukraine as part of a historical Russia, and thinks that the modern state of Ukraine is a quasi-state created by the Soviet Union. For Putin, the former Soviet republics have to be satellites, and if they refuse to agree to be that, they can and should be punished when favorable circumstances arise. This is particularly true for Ukraine. Earlier during the war, Putin compared himself to Peter the Great as the so-called gatherer of Russian lands. He sees himself as a great Russian leader who wants to fix the perceived injustices of the past and make Russia great again. And Ukraine is the crown jewel of this imperial project of occupation and aggression. 
the invasion of Ukraine can be justified neither from the perspective of international law nor ethically. And no, the America did it too argument is not valid, as violations committed by other countries cannot be used as justifications for your own crimes. Number 2. Biolabs One of the common propaganda points disseminated by Russia as a pretext for aggression against Ukraine is the claim that the United States has opened laboratories in Ukraine which develop biological weapons. Some of these circulated myths are that those labs develop specially trained migratory birds and diseased bats and experiment on Ukrainian soldiers to turn them into aggressive, zombie-like creatures impervious to pain. It is worth noting that in the 1980s the Soviet Union launched a disinformation campaign accusing the United States of deliberately spreading AIDS. Ever since Russia started spreading its narrative on biolabs in Ukraine, pro-Russian figures and far-right or far-left media outlets in the West have joined in too. At first, their claims were based on absolutely unsubstantiated accusations. But when on the 9th of June 2022, the Pentagon released its fact sheet on WMD threat reduction efforts in the former Soviet Union, conspiracy theorists got really excited and thought they were onto something. This document mentioned that the United States supports 46 laboratories in Ukraine, specializing in, to quote, Ukraine's biological safety, security and disease surveillance for both human and animal health. These facilities were launched within the framework of the Nunlugar Cooperative Threat Reduction CTR, program after the adoption of the Soviet Threat Reduction Act of 1991 in Congress. The purpose of this program was to assist the former Soviet countries with handling of nuclear materials, weapons and facilities following the collapse of the Soviet Union to eliminate any nuclear-related risks. The US Department of Defense has cooperated with the Ukrainian Ministry of Health since 2005 to improve the work of public health laboratories. According to this document, Ukraine also volunteered for an external World Health Organization-led mission to assess the state of these facilities in 2021. The fact sheet also informs that the United States has conducted similar activities in other former Soviet republics, like Georgia, Kazakhstan, Armenia and Uzbekistan, adding that they cooperated with Russia in this work. Nothing in this document indicates that the United States is developing biological weapons in Ukraine. The document that the Americans have published as a response to this conspiracy theory is the main argument backing this claim. Neither the Kremlin nor anyone else has provided any credible evidence to back it up so far. Number 3. NATO Expansion When the US attempted to find a diplomatic solution to the crisis around Ukraine prior to the start of the full-scale invasion, one of the main demands of Russia was the rollback of the NATO enlargement that happened after 1997. This would mean abolishing the NATO membership of the former Soviet republics of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, and former Eastern European satellites of the Soviet Union, like Poland, Hungary and others. Russia also demanded NATO's commitment to not expand to former Soviet republics like Ukraine and Georgia. Russia sees Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union as its traditional spheres of influence, and considers the NATO expansion into these territories as an unfriendly and aggressive action by the US. The Russian narrative of NATO expansion attempts to portray it as something imposed by the Americans on Central and Eastern European nations largely against their wills. Is it against their will, though? Every state is free to choose its own allies. Every state is free to sign defense treaties with other nations. In 1997, Hungary held a referendum on NATO accession, where 85% of people voted in favor. The other aforementioned states joined NATO based on their governments and parliaments' decisions and votes. The level of support for NATO membership is high in these countries, particularly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. According to the Globsec survey published on the 31st of May 2022, 89% in Poland, 84% in Lithuania, 80% in Hungary, 77% in Romania, 72% in Latvia and Czechia, 70% in Estonia, 63% in Slovakia, and 54% in Bulgaria want their countries to remain in NATO. Simply because these countries have been occupied by Imperial Russia and or by the Soviet Union at different stages of their history, they see Russia as an existential threat and consider NATO membership to be the best arrangement to guarantee their security and independence. 
and nobody can blame them, especially after the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008 and of Ukraine since 2014. Had Ukraine and Georgia been accepted to NATO in 2008, as they had hoped for, they would have arguably avoided aggression from Russia. It is also very interesting that Russia is ready to give up the defense of the Kaliningrad Oblast surrounded by NATO in favor of attacking Ukraine, or deploy units on the border with member of NATO Finland to Ukraine without fearing an attack from NATO from there. This shows how much Putin really fears an attack from NATO, and how at this point it is more of a propaganda narrative than a real threat. We should also mention that the pro-Russian propaganda keeps claiming that the US promised not to expand NATO in 1990, but no such treaty was ever signed. The negotiations held between the then Soviet President Gorbachev and the US Secretary of State Baker were largely about the reunification of Germany. Number 4. Neo-Nazis Russia wants everyone to believe that they are fighting Nazis who took over the Ukrainian government and currently hold the Ukrainian people hostage. After all, one of the initially declared goals of the Russian invasion was the denazification of Ukraine. This narrative is multi-layered and requires explanation at several levels. 2014 was an eventful and difficult year for Ukraine. The Ukrainian people ousted the corrupt pro-Russian president Yanukovych in the Euromaidan revolution. This was followed by the annexation of Crimea and the pro-Russian forces starting the proxy war in Donbass, which regular Russian troops joined almost immediately. It became very apparent that the Ukrainian army of 2014 was weak, disorganized, corrupt, and in some cases under the influence of Moscow. Some refused to fight the Russians or switched allegiances to Russia. Russia was taking over Ukrainian land, but its army could not stop it. That is when volunteer battalions started to form in Ukraine to fight back and assist the regular Ukrainian army. Naturally, the most outraged group was the Ukrainian nationalists, as it almost always is in post-revolutionary societies facing foreign aggression. Hence, some of the most vocal volunteer battalions like Azov, Idar and Right Sector had far-right or neo-Nazi tendencies. This harmed Ukraine's global reputation significantly. Obviously, Russian propaganda also played its role by using this opportunity to portray basically all Ukrainians fighting against them as fascists. Volunteer battalions, including those with far-right tendencies, were gradually incorporated into the Ukrainian military and Ministry of Interior. The Ukrainian government arrested or prosecuted dozens of volunteer soldiers for their crimes. There is still a debate about whether these battalions remain far-right but many argue that after the incorporation of these units, they became de-ideologized. Currently, many members of these battalions are ethnic minorities. Surely some people fighting for Azov and other formerly volunteer battalions have a far-right ideology, but not as many as in 2014. What about Ukrainian politics? In the 2014 post-revolution parliamentary elections, the strongest nationalist party of Ukraine, Svoboda, Freedom, got less than 5% of the vote. In the 2019 elections, they got even less, 2%. The incumbent Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is Jewish. The leader of the parliamentary faction of the ruling party, David Arakamia, is Georgian. The speaker of the parliament from 2014 to 2016 and the prime minister in 2016 to 2019, Volodymyr Groisman, is Jewish. The former Minister of Interior, who served from 2014 to 2021, Arsen Avakov, is Armenian. We can expand the list of post-2014 Ukrainian political and business elite members among minorities. Accusing the Jewish president of neo-Nazi ideology is ridiculous. The above list does not look like the list of people who would advocate racial purity. Of course, all Ukrainian presidents, governments and political figures have used harsh rhetoric against Russia since 2014. But can you blame them? Calling the current Ukrainian government neo-Nazi is simply false. Putting aside how rampant fascism and neo-Nazism are in Russia, even among the senior officials, and the blood and soil rhetoric of Putin himself, the Russian president was all too happy to exchange many senior Azov fighters who became prisoners of war after the siege of Mariupol for his relative Medvedchuk. Much anti-fascist, very Antifa. Number 5. Russia is fighting an existential threat, it had no other choice. 
We have already touched upon this propaganda narrative, but let's expand. Since Putin's Operation Z took way longer than he expected, some of the narratives had to be changed. The Kremlin had to adjust its messages to the public in the face of setbacks on the battlefield. Since the stated claims of demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine and protection of the people of Donbass did not gain much traction with the Russian people, the Russian government had to come up with another explanation for their aggression. That is when the siege mentality, the us against them mentality, came into play. Russia had to start its war because the West was expanding towards our borders. We did not even start the war, we just responded to Ukrainian provocations. The Kremlin started selling the idea that Russia would be under a grave threat if it had not started the war, so it had to strike first. Was Russia under an imminent threat of attack in February 2022? Absolutely not. There's no evidence or indication of that. When Russia started amassing troops on the Ukrainian border, the West responded by supplying Ukraine with defensive weapons and engaging in negotiations with Russia. NATO had no intention of responding with military force against Russia. Even now, when the Russian military is at its weakest since arguably the early 1990s, NATO is not directly engaged in the conflict. It wants to avoid any direct confrontation with Russia due to the threat of a nuclear war. Otherwise, it could have easily taken, for instance, Kaliningrad, which is surrounded by NATO on all sides, as a retaliation for the attack on Ukraine. We discussed above how Ukraine was in no position to attack Russia for many reasons, one of which is that they simply did not have a large arsenal of modern weapons. We can make a mental exercise for the purpose of debunking this myth too. Send yourself to February 23rd, 2022 and think about these questions. What would have happened if Russia did not invade Ukraine? Would Russia be attacked by NATO or Ukraine? Was Ukraine strong enough to liberate the Russian-controlled Crimea and Donbass? The answer is no. NATO or Ukraine would not attack Russia proper or Russia-occupied territory, and the conflict in Ukraine would still probably be frozen, sans occasional shelling by both sides. Number 6. Donbass Genocide one of the most commonly referred casus belli of Russia in this war is the claimed genocide of Russian and Russian-speaking people in Ukraine. Troubles in Donbass started following the occupation of Crimea and clashes between pro-European and pro-Russian groups in Ukraine. The local pro-Russian population in Donbass and provocateurs from Russia organized a wave of demonstrations throughout the cities of Donbass, calling on Putin to send troops and annex the region. These demonstrations were often followed by the capture of regional and city administration buildings and police departments, which allowed pro-Russian groups to access weapon caches. The new Ukrainian government responded with the anti-terrorist operation in Donbass and sent green conscripts of the Ukrainian army to restore order. Armed groups led by Russian security operatives like Igor streklov gherkin had no trouble in killing or capturing many of them and taking their weapons. This process quickly evolved into a full-scale conflict in eastern Ukraine. According to the UN, in the period from April 2014 to December 2021, more than 14,000 people died in Donbass. Around 6,500 separatists from Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts and Russian soldiers, around 4,400 Ukrainian soldiers and 3,404 civilians. This conflict, initiated by Russia, took place in a mostly urban setting in this war, which has caused high civilian casualties due to shelling with old and imprecise artillery and MLRS systems on both sides. Moreover, there have been significant numbers of civilian casualties caused by landmines. International organizations condemned both sides for violating laws of war in 2014 to 2021. However, Genocide is a legal term with more or less clear definitions and benchmarks. First, there must be clear evidence of a policy toward the extermination of a specific group by the Ukrainian government or its military leadership. There is no such evidence. During this conflict, there were several cases when the Ukrainian army retook earlier lost areas in Donbass, but there is no evidence showing that they attempted extermination of peoples in these areas. This leads us to another crucial component of a legal definition of genocide. The perpetrator should possess some level of effective control over the area where it intends to harm the persecuted group systematically. 
Throughout the conflict, Ukraine did not possess any effective control over rebel-run territories. Most of the civilian casualties in rebel-controlled territories have been caused by shelling, which does not make it any easier for victims and their families. But it also demonstrates that Russian accusations of genocide in Donbass clearly fall short of the legal definition of this term. This is not to say that civilian casualties can be justified. Militaries should do their best to avoid any civilian harm. Another accusation by Russia against Ukraine, to substantiate its claims of genocide, is related to the economic isolation policy conducted by the Ukrainian government during this period. The deputy chairman of the Russian Duma committee, Alexei Chepa, justified his claims of a genocide by saying that people are not paid their salaries, they are isolated, they are prevented from developing their economy, their water and gas supply is cut. But this cannot be interpreted as a genocidal policy. Moreover, Ukraine continued paying pensions to people in occupied territories, but admittedly did so in a very uncomfortable way for the residents of Donbass. They would have to travel to Ukraine-controlled territories and register every once in a while, and an inability to do so for two months would lead to a loss of pensions. This was arguably done to maintain links with citizens in occupied areas and ensure their loyalty to Ukraine. So Chepa's argument has nothing to do with genocide. It is also important to mention that the majority of the civilian casualties in Donbass occurred in 2014 and 2015. Afterwards, the number of fatalities dropped considerably, and most were attributed to the mines that were placed in the early years of the conflict. For example, just 26 civilians died in Donbass in 2020 due to the war, and only 25 in 2021. To contrast, the full-scale war Putin started in February 2022 with a claim that it was to stop an ongoing genocide, led to the deaths of tens of thousands of civilians, with no end in sight. We will continue talking about this conflict as we consider covering it to be of the utmost importance. If you don't want to miss future episodes, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.